pulmonary uh, inflammation can occur, and this is in the form of what we call pneumonitis, so an inflammation in the lung tissue. Now, this can be a little bit more difficult and challenging to diagnose, particularly for patients that have either lung metastases or lung cancer, because again, the symptoms are very subtle. You might have an increase in shortness of breath at rest, cough, wheeze, uh, decrease exercise tolerance. So the important thing is that we have an understanding of what your exercise tolerance is before you start your therapy. We understand what your oxygen saturation is when you come in to start treatment, and that we also understand what your, what your oxygen saturation is after you've been active and even walking around, even taking a walk down the hall uh, during clinic, so that we understand that what the variation is in your pulmonary status. I've had several patients that have been on therapy that, of course, get very worried that if they've got a subtle change in their pulmonary status that, oh my goodness, this must mean that I've got progression of disease. The first thing I think about with anybody on immunotherapy is, oh, they've got an inflammatory response from the therapy. But the way we under, uh, help to evaluate that is, again, looking at the oxygen saturation, obtaining a CT scan, and ruling out other infectious causes also ruling out progression of disease, and then perhaps needing a bronchoscopy to actually identify if there are inflammatory cells. So you might need to undergo a procedure for that to help, to help uh, evaluate that. Management, very similar to the other, supportive care, perhaps hydration if you need it, oxygen supplementation, or maybe an increase in oxygen supplementation if you didn't, if you had required it beforehand. IV steroids, perhaps even an inhaled steroid, antibiotic prophylaxis and again, evaluating to make sure that there's not uh, progression. Liver inflammation, hepatitis. Again, these uh, organs can all have uh, inflammation from the, from the therapy. Often this is asymptomatic. It's a little different than the infectious hepatitis that you might see in the cases of hepatitis C, hepatitis B, where patients tend to be much more symptomatic. Typically what we see for patients that have the early stages of hepatitis is just a slight increase in your liver function tests. And those are typically done with every visit that you come in. So we're looking at AST, ALT, uh, total and direct bilirubin. Again, patients can be asymptomatic, but this is the time that we wanna identify if they've got a hepatitis uh, that's going on. Patients might complain of very mild nausea, mild abdominal discomfort, but typically that is really um, the extent of it. Uh, if it did progress, you might develop jaundice or yellowing of the sclera of the eyes or yellowing of the skin, but normally we're gonna identify it before it gets to, to that point. Uh, the management really isn't changing much from what we've talked about as far as the others. You're going to hold the therapy for a brief amount of time, perhaps um, also starting the steroids, and then uh, prophylactic antibiotics. One of the things we wanna keep in mind with liver toxicity or hepatitis is uh, really minimizing any other medications that patients are taking uh, that might also be metabolized by the liver. So keep in mind if you are on anything like herbal medicines, over-the-counter medicines, particularly Tylenol is a big one that can cause uh, an elevation in your liver function test, you want to make sure that you're discussing that with your healthcare provider beforehand, and you may be asked to discontinue those which are not uh, necessary for you so that you can minimize any of those, those liver toxic drugs so that you can hopefully go on to continue your therapy. Kidney inflammation also cause uh, renal uh, inflammation. Acute uh, interstitial nephritis may occur. Often this is very uh, uh, asymptomatic as well, and we identify this on abnormal blood tests. So a rise in a patient's BUN or creatinine when you come in. Uh, typically you'll be asked to provide additional urine samples so that we can make sure that there's not another inflammatory cause of this interstitial nephritis. Uh, additional blood work, also obtaining some uh, a nephrology consult if needed occasionally in a uh, renal uh, ultrasound and renal biopsy to identify if this is uh, an infectious process, if it's another kidney dysfunction uh, disorder that's going on, or if it's truly an inflammatory response uh, to the therapy. Management, very similar, is providing adequate hydration, although you want to be sure that the patient is not having difficulty excreting uh, normal urine or decreased urine output so that you don't provide uh, too much hydration and fluid overload the patient. Holding treatment, steroid infusion, and then antibiotic prophylaxis. 
Neurologic in, uh, inflammation uh, is, I've, I've seen it much less frequently than some of the others, although as I said, all of these at, at the grade three and four are very rare. In my patient population, our studies have been less than 5% of all the things that we're talking about. Um, but neurologic complications, patients may develop some weakness in the arms or legs, uh, numbness and tingling in their fingertips or toes. And again, these are changes over baseline, not things that you might have experienced from the prior therapies that you've been on. You want to rule out any systemic central nervous system infectious process, rule out a stroke, rule out your uh, progression of disease. Again, the treatment is going to be uh, steroids, uh, which you start intravenously and then taper to an oral dosing. Uh, dermatologic uh, inflammation we are noticing more frequently, and typically these are grade one and two, very small changes in the skin. You may see small patches, uh, small discolorations uh, uh, of the skin. Occasionally patients are developing rashes. They may start out on the trunk. They may become a little bit more diffuse. They may be pruritic, meaning that they're itchy. Um, again, you may also have some blistering. Very, very, very rare to have a more toxic uh, dermatologic side effect uh, such as that. Patients have, uh, may also develop, uh, in terms of derm toxicity, even some small oral lesions or oral tenderness, uh, which are usually just treated uh, symptomatically. If there is a diffuse rash that develops or patchy, scaly rashes that are really pruritic and bothersome to your daily living, then you'd be referred for a dermatology consult. You want to rule out any allergic complications, not inflammatory complications, but uh, uh, just contact dermatitis such as that. And a skin biopsy can help be helpful in helping to identify the cause of that. Typically, it's topical therapy, really just supportive. Uh, topical corticosteroids, uh, emollient uh, lotions, uh, hypoallergenic soaps and, and uh, bathing uh, lotions that you're going to be using. If a patient does have any uh, open areas, you may be prescribed a topical antibiotic before moving on to some more uh, systemic therapies, such as an oral uh, anti-itch or antipyretic uh, medication. Okay, uh, And steroids, have, obviously, if you've got a significant inflammatory response. Ocular uh, inflammation can also occur. Patients may come in, particularly it tends to be one side versus the other, but it can, can occur with, uh, with both of your eyes in the way of uh, uveitis, iritis, or conjunctivitis. Uh, it occurs on, again, less than 6% of patients as far as the side effect. Patients may just say, I've got some irritation in my eye. I think I might have just slept wrong or maybe rubbed my eyes wrong. Um, but what you want to do is hold the therapy that day, well, if it's really significant. We tend to proceed with the therapy. Uh, referred to an ophthalmologist, and normally uh, uh, steroid eye drops uh, can provide symptomatic control. So really, what are the keys to the man uh, management for patients? The key really is rapid diagnostic and treatment interventions. It's imperative for optimal control so that you don't progress to a grade three or grade four toxicity. Most of these are managed at a grade one or a grade two. If you are started on, on steroids, if the IV steroids are switched over to oral steroids to go home, it's really imperative that that is only tapered under the healthcare provider's discretion because if you rapidly decrease those steroids at home, you may have a flare of the symptoms. Um, so early discontinuation may really put you at risk for progression of the symptoms or a relapse. So only decrease at the, at the supervision of your healthcare provider. It is possible to have reinitiation of the therapy after you've had some of these side effects, even some of the grade three side effects. But the decision to restart is really not always clear. You've heard earlier that we're not sure exactly how many cycles that we need to do to mount that immune response for you. It may be that four cycles is enough. And if you have a side effect or toxicity beyond that, that perhaps you don't need to go on to get any more therapy. So that decision is really going to be between uh, you and your health care provider in terms of what is in your best interest safely. And it may not mean that you're going to have decreased effect from your immunotherapy. So patient education, one of the other things that we've heard a little bit about earlier is the potential for uh, tumor flare. One of the things that we think about after we uh, start therapy is if a patient has a sudden progression of symptoms, and I'll use lung cancer for an example. Uh, we had a, had a patient recently after one cycle, two weeks after their first cycle of uh, anti-PD-1 therapy that came in with a significant increase uh, in chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, decreased oxygen saturation. And on further evaluation, it looked like their tumor had been progressing. We went on to continue therapy because it wasn't thought to be a pneumonitis uh, effect, but more of a tumor effect. 
Uh, and the thought is, is that it does take your immune system a bit of time to really rev up and to, to recognize tumor begin, before you begin to see a response. Some patients may have a tumor flare, so progression of symptoms may look like on your CAT scan that you have progression of symptoms. Occasionally, even new tumors might be identified before you see a response after several cycles of therapy. And again, that decision is going to be between you and your healthcare provider in terms of identifying really what is pseudoprogression or what is a pneumonitis or toxicity of therapy. One of the, some of the things you need to keep in mind prior to starting therapy is making sure that you're providing an adequate health history uh, to your healthcare provider, particularly if you have any history of an autoimmune uh, dysfunction, because if you already have a, a body that's uh, uh, causing some attack on it with its immune system on normal healthy tissues, such as any of the ones that are listed here, you may, uh, may not be uh, enrolled in some of the clinical trials initially. And I think there's still going to be some uh, uh, work looking at whether or not patients with any autoimmune diseases can be treated on the immunotherapies or how we do that safely. But it is important to let your healthcare provider know if you have any of these so that they can be alerted to your risks for potential side effects or whether, whether the therapy is appropriate for you or not. If you're on any immunosuppressant therapy drugs initially, you need to certainly let us know. And any change in any of your uh, symptoms over baseline. Uh, another thing is to let us know. Many people are uh, treated at what we call tertiary uh, hospitals, which is what my center is. So patients are living closer to, their, uh, to other hospitals. If you get admitted to another hospital, treated by another physician, please let your healthcare provider know who's treating with your immunotherapy so that they can uh, collaborate and manage your symptoms. And with that, just letting us know what your medications are that you're taking, any change in your medications. Uh, particularly, do not start any over-the-counter medications, uh, even if they're herbal therapies uh, or whatnot, without first getting that, that cleared. And I think we've gone over those. But just to reinforce that these side effects of grade 3 and 4 really are rare. Again, it's like less than 10%, in most cases less than 5%, but they're well managed if, you, if we have early identification and you can safely go on to get uh, treated. So I thank you all for all of the things that you do for helping us move forward.